It's the 10th of March, 2015, and this is episode 194. This show is intended for informational and educational purposes only. What cryptocurrency enables is new, empowering, and exciting, but we're not experts. Just obsessed companions walking the road towards a more peer-to-peer future. On today's show, we join John Barrett over at Bitcoins and Gravy for an interview conducted earlier this year that really caught my attention with Patrick Burns, CEO of Overstock and so-called Scourge of Wall Street. If you're a Bitcoins and Gravy listener, you've probably already heard this, but even so, it's a really fantastic interview and worth another listen. A couple of quick notes before I hand things off to John. Let's Talk Bitcoin currently has a request for quotes out to designers interested in working with the team here to modernize and improve the user experience on the website. If you'd like to check out what we're looking for and see if your work might be a fit, you can find a link to the RFQ in the show notes at letstalkbitcoin.com. I'm pretty much past this flu thing, so new episodes of LTB will be starting up again on Saturday, and we're resuming host recordings this Thursday with the folks from Open Bazaar. But that's the future. For now, just settle in and enjoy the show. Here's John. Welcome to Bitcoins and Gravy, and thanks for joining me today as I podcast from East Nashville, Tennessee, with my trusty Siberian husky, Maxwell, by my side. Say hello, Maxwell. (laughs) I'm just your everyday Bitcoin enthusiast who loves talking with people about Bitcoin and sharing what I learn with you, the listeners, here at the dawn of the age of digital currencies. If you've been here before, welcome back. If this is your first time, welcome to the show. On today's show, I am honored to be speaking with a modern-day American patriot, Mr. Patrick Byrne, the CEO of Overstock.com. Patrick teaches us about public education in the United States and how it is sadly broken on many levels, with more money often going to administration than to our teachers and our students. How sad, right? Patrick also tells us the truth about the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. He talks to us about mobsters on Wall Street and the crooked games they've all but perfected to rob this country blind. And, of course, he tells us about his project to create the stock market of the future, where, with any luck, we'll have a level and fair playing field. On today's show, I am honored to be speaking with a very successful entrepreneur, a well-known pioneer in e-commerce, and in my opinion, a true American hero who has shown great bravery in speaking out against crime on Wall Street and injustices on Main Street. Patrick Byrne, welcome to Bitcoins and Gravy. John, it's an honor to be on your show. Oh, yes, sir. And, you know, I just learned today that you are from Indiana, which makes you a Hoosier. Is that right? I was born in Fort Wayne in 1962. Nice, man. Well, I was born in West Lafayette, Indiana in 1963 Ah. (laughs) when my parents were attending Purdue University, uh, but I was raised in Indianapolis. So we have two Hoosiers here talking. (laughs) This may be a first on Bitcoins and Gravy. I'm not sure, but... um, You'll probably have to speed this up for uh, everybody else. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's nice. So you you live in Salt Lake City now, is that right? Yes, I do. Sandy. Yeah, my brother lives out there. He's been there the better part of 20 years, and he loves it. Let me ask you, did they ever move that industrial section out of the city? I know that winter in particular can be bad there in terms of air pollution. You know, they didn't. And to be honest, it's kind of funny. It's making an environmentalist out of the Republicans here. Utah is a generally (laughs) Republican state. Right. Uh, no comments, not, no, <laughs> no, no judging or applause. I'm just stating a fact, generally Republican, and yeah. of course largely Latter-day Saint. Right. And the Republicans have not always been at the forefront of the environmental cause, but now that the Salt Lake Valley, Utah's a fabulous place to live. Great outdoors, mm-hmm. great national parks, state parks. But now the Salt Lake Bowl has this effect called inversion every winter. When the air is still, the valley will fill up. You think you're in Mexico City or Beijing, the air pollution's so bad wow. until they get some precipitation. And suddenly, 
these uh, good, stout Republican Utah, and they're starting to realize, well, the uh, they should be environmentalists. Wow, that's great. I guess that uh, disproves the old adage, you can't teach an old dog <laughs> a new trick. <laughs> also, you, know, you often hear it said that necessity is the mother of invention. I've always said, no, it's desperation <laughs> is the mother of invention. But, uh, okay, so let's see, Patrick, you are a champion of education. You are also known as the scourge of Wall Street because you have fought long and hard against the corrupt there on Wall Street, the very obvious corruption, I might add. And of course, as the CEO of Overstock.com, you also accept Bitcoin for your products. I know you have many more projects underway, so I will pass it over to you, sir, and I will put the ball in your court. Well, I'd love to talk to you. You're hitting my three favorite subjects, uh, education, Wall Street, and the crypto revolution. Not only am I the scourge of Wall Street, as Wired Magazine calls me, and quite true, in 2007, I was called the most hated man on Wall Street which I'm quite proud of, and they can carve in my tombstone that in 2007 I was the most hated. But also, you can go today to the NEA.org website. The Teachers Union is the National Education Association, and the NEA website has a list of, you know how much unions hate Walmart, for example, or right. they're all down on Walmart. They have a list on the NEA website of public enemies of the United States, or like public enemy number one. Well, if you look on the list, Walmart's number two. I'm number one. Oh. So I'm the most hated man oh. by the teachers union, and I'm the most hated man on Wall Street. And that's a life well lived, I think. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Let me start by, and by the way, I love teachers. I love teachers. Teachers are sacred, but the teachers union isn't sacred. Let me start with <laughs> education on Wall Street. The two propellers on the ship of state that move any country forward, any civilization, I think, are really its means of acquiring human capital or creating human capital, and its means of marrying human capital to financial capital. Okay. And the way those are done in the United States, by and large, the way we create human capital is the government school system, and the way we marry it to financial capital is Wall Street. And so that means that the school system and Wall Street are the two things we have to get right. Now, everything else you got to, I mean, there's other things you have to do. You got to protect borders. You got to have rule of law and courts and things like that, mm-hmm. please. But the two things that propel society are education and Wall Street. And both of those systems are broken. Mm-hmm. The way to fix education is to recognize that what we have is a top-down model. You know, behind that local high school that you know and love, there's all these levels you don't see. There's the district, the county, the state, and the federal. Mm -hmm. And they absorb huge amounts of the funding. And suppose you were talking to some Soviet apparatchik hack from 1980, 1975, who was, you know, Defending the Soviet agricultural system, and, and but just saying how you know what a shame it is that they'd had seventy years of bad harvest since they collectivized everything, mm-hmm. and but they were saying, well, we're going to fix it because we're going to get smarter people in Moscow. You know, the, the Soviet agricultural system worked by folks in Moscow giving orders down a chain of command, so some farmer in Siberia was getting told what he should grow and when he should plant stuff like that, mm-hmm. and suppose that. Some apparatchik were saying, well, we're going to improve the system by getting bigger computers in Moscow and smarter people in Moscow and better rules. And you were trying to convince them, you know, maybe the solution is you just stop having it be top down, Hmm. have it be grassroots, have the decisions made where the information is. And that would just sort of blow fuses in the person's mind. But we have the same issue here. We have an education system that is largely driven from the top, either the federal or the state, or the county, or the district. And the truth is, it should be driven from the bottom up. And the way you do that is you give every family a voucher. We're spending about $16,000 a year per student now in public schools in America, $16,000 per student. Hmm. Give anyone who wants it a voucher for $8,000. So the government would save so much money, we could balance our checkbooks and you know, easily, if about 30% of kids took that deal, would balance all the state checkbooks. But secondly, 
you'd have a much better education system. You'd have people voting with their feet and you'd have all kinds of innovation in the school system that you can't do now within this kind of Soviet style, top down guild system that we now have. So that's the way you fix the first propeller of education. You get vouchers. You know, you talk about education in Soviet style and it makes me think of a time when Hitler and Stalin and Mussolini worked to revamp the educational systems in their countries to serve their purposes. Is it possible that that top down system is specific? specifically aimed at dumbing kids down? Well, it is specifically aimed at indoctrination. And if you don't believe that, look into the roots of the history of public education in the United States, Horace Mann. Mm -hmm. Uh, There were a bunch of elitist Bostonians, basically, who really were afraid of the Catholic wave and the Catholics and the Jews washing up on American shores, basically. The public school system was developed as a way of indoctrinating uh, and preventing kids from learning their parents' values, but indoctrinating them into a new set of values. So it's very much associated with the anti-Catholic and anti-Jewish sentiment of the late 19th century. Uh, And to this day, I mean, there are, they're muted about it, but behind closed doors or in less public places, some of the arguments people have against vouchers, against giving parents choice, is that they would lose their ability to indoctrinate. And what is their ability to indoctrinate? As Milton Friedman used to say, a socialist education system will teach socialist values and a free market education system will teach free values. The fact that we have government running the school system means that the school system indoctrinates children in really a very pro-government worldview. You know, I'm, I'm probably naive in some ways, but I was shocked when my nieces, my little nieces came home from school and I was visiting them and they're giving me the same curriculum. They're telling me, I'm asking, what are you learning here? What are you learning? They're telling me the exact same curriculum that I was learning back in 1973. And I'm thinking, my God, this is ridiculous because, well, because some of what they're learning is patently ridiculous. Well, there's not an industry in America where there's been less innovation than education. It's beginning to happen around the edges, but basically how most kids go to school today, if you took somebody in a time machine from 1880 and put them in a classroom today, they would immediately recognize it for exactly what it was, where that's not the case. With just about any other job you can think of, that's not the case. They've changed tremendously because there's innovation. And there is so little innovation because ultimately there's not choice. You need choice. And the first step towards choice is what some places like Oakland are doing. And some states have this now, I guess, where you can go to any public school you want and your funding goes with you. So you get some choice. It's Mm -hmm. it's like Henry Ford saying you can have any color you want as long as it's black. (laughs) Uh, But that's some choice. The next step towards choice is charter schools. So I support charter schools. I think it's Mm -hmm. a great idea. But it's still choice within a very narrow range that the apparatchiks get to define for the parents. Real full choice is you give them the vouchers and then you start having all kinds of educational entrepreneurs spring up and teach kids. And I think that you'd have over a decade, it would just launch America. It would propel us so much if uh, if we could go to that system. I agree. And you're talking about choices. I've got a friend who's a social worker on the south side of Chicago. She's been doing that for years. She loves it, but it's also a huge stress on her life. And she's experienced burnout in the last year, and she's trying to come back from that. But talk about no choices. You know, you're talking about going into almost a policing situation, a battling situation where teachers are battling the administration, and then they're also having to battle the students, but they're having to protect the students from things that are going on in the school that are set up by the administration. I mean, it's just a bad situation in some of the bigger cities in particular. Yeah, I, I feel, I love the teachers. I feel, sorry. here's something, so the teachers union hates me because the guild always wants to protect its monopoly, and that's why the NEA has me as public enemy number one, right. uh, and Walmart's number two. I think that's hilarious, and it's right <laughs> up on their website now. Uh, but I have great feel for the teachers. And the way I try to get teachers on my side is to point out to teachers, teachers on average, there's about $400,000 going into the system now for every teacher. Hmm. But I don't think there are many teachers making $400,000. Teachers make on average about $55,000. And if you add benefits, this according to the National Labor Board, if you add benefits, it's probably about 65000 If you add the cost of a, of a classroom, and heat, heating and lighting and cleaning and so forth. You know, you'd be hard pressed to identify a hundred thousand dollars of cost to actually put a teacher in a classroom in front of kids. Right. So there's a hundred thousand the cost. Where's the other three hundred thousand go? So when I make that point to teachers, they often realize I'm not the enemy. 
Hmm. I'm on their side. You could have teachers making hundred two. I mean, great teachers could be making two hundred thousand. There's four hundred thousand dollars of funding in the system for every actual teacher, and they're not seeing the money. The money is going to all these other levels that people don't think about. Yeah, where is that money going? I mean, is it primarily going into administration? Administration within the school system, lots of bells and whistles. About half of it is being eaten up outside the classroom. Like I say, you have federal, state, county, and district. Find your local school district headquarters and go, look, you might find there's some $25 million office building you never knew about, and it's just there to oversee some high schools and such. Well, why do we even need that? Why do we need the state? Why do we need... There's just all these levels of bureaucracy. Now, when you go to attack it, they'll trot out their local high school teachers. Oh, this guy doesn't like teachers. No, man, I love teachers. The local high school teacher is just the prop for them. Mm -hmm. But what they're really defending are these layers of bureaucracy that they don't want there to be any accountability for. How sad to think that there are actually adults that would collude in such a manner that would hurt our children. Honestly, that's unforgivable. The president of uh, American Federation for Teachers, I guess, in 1985 said to a group of teachers, union members, that I'll start worrying about kids when they start paying union dues. Mm. And even Governor Cuomo of New York just said, like last week, he's come out, he's getting all this. I can't believe we're finally getting, you know, a Democratic politician saying this stuff because they've been so beholden to the teachers union. But Andrew Cuomo came out and lit into the teachers union over the weekend and making a lot of these same points. And boy, I really respect the heck out of Governor Cuomo for having the courage to do that to his own base. Well, wow, that's great. And, you know, we do see things that give me hope, like a few years back when the teachers of Chicago rallied and took to the streets and basically slapped Rahm Emanuel down. <laughs> My friend was there marching with the teachers, and she said it was a beautiful thing to see. So there is hope. But, yeah, I love hearing that about Cuomo. I hadn't heard that. I should probably keep up on that a little bit more. All right. Well, let's see. I once read that you had taken out a full-page advertisement in the Washington Post wherein you talked about naked short-selling as stealing from widows, retirees, and other small investors. So there's that. And then I've heard you speak about knowing that the SEC has colluded with organized crime. And of course, you were angry and brave enough to broadcast that fact out to the world. I have to say, this reminds me of Elliot Ness, <laughs> you know, busting bootleggers during Prohibition, <laughs> but on a much more dangerous scale. I mean, there were organized crime bosses and their underlings who were trying to kill Elliot Ness and others, right? Of course, I have a great deal of respect for any American hero uh, like Garrison Keillor when he spoke out against the wars in the Middle East a few years back. Uh, and got a lot of flack for it. I have a lot of respect for American heroes, and so I can't help but kind of worry about you and your safety, and I'm certain that you've had those same feelings yourself. Well, my theory's always been if they blow me up, I win. That's <laughs> one of the reasons I got so public and out there. I did get death threats some years ago, mm -hmm. and I made a choice to get out there, as, go over the top, get as public as possible, so that if they blow me up, I win. Yeah. In 2002, we went public. And when you're a public company CEO, you're out there mingling with hedge funds, and prime brokers and regulators, journalists and expert network systems. It started becoming clear to me very quickly that there was a bunch of criminality going on. It was mm -hmm. quite well known. And I mean, it was well known within the hedge fund community how the game was being played. And there was a constellation of dirty hedge funds centered on a guy named Stephen Cohen and a constellation of about 15 hedge funds. And they were all working together to some degree. They had a similar system of getting inside information. It was called the expert network system. And they were both trading on inside information and creating, in a sense, inside information by rigging the market. And that there were ways to actually rig the market, not in big companies, but in smaller companies, you could actually do things to manipulate the market. And I gathered a lot of evidence of this and then started bringing it to people like the SEC. I mean, I went to the SEC and explained the whole going public, what was going on within the IPO system and some of the things that had been told to me when we were going public by bankers who wanted to take us public and promises that were made and overtures that were made, absolutely criminal things. Hmm. I started taking it and telling the SEC, and I got no action. And I went to the Senate Banking Committee and House Financial Services, and I went to some prominent journalists on Wall Street. And what I learned was they were all kind of in bed together, and these big hedge funds, and Stephen Cohen being the worst, nobody wanted to touch. They'd go after little guys 
Nobody wanted to touch. And in fact, the hedge funds and their law firms were hiring people out of the SEC. Hmm. There's a tradition in Wall Street, and I don't know if I've ever even said this publicly, but there's kind of a, an ethic in Wall Street that if there's a, if an Elliott Ness rises up in the SEC, somebody with leadership ability, it isn't brains, they, uh, but somebody with leadership ability, they get poached. And the idea is all the bankers and hedge funds know to do this is the idea is to leave behind kind of a managerial gray goo at the SEC that's incapable of getting out of its own way. So if anybody shows up with any real talent, they get poached and they get offered, you know, a million eight dollars a year to go join some law firm that's representing Goldman Sachs. Hmm. And so what gets left behind is largely a gray goop. Now, I like the woman who's running the SEC now, and I think that the SEC is better than it was six or seven years ago, but I still think the SEC should be just made part of the DOJ. Mm -hmm. But that's a subject for a different day. So then what I was sort of pulling on the thread of who are these hedge funds who are doing this and how are they manipulating the market, it became very clear that there's really quite a blurry line between organized crime and the hedge fund community. And some hedge fund people have absolute out-and-out out deep organized crime backgrounds. For example, Michael Steinhardt, his father, Saul Steinhardt, was the largest mafia fence in America, worked for the Genovese family, was sentenced to 10 years in Sing Sing, and was called by Frank Hogan as the prosecutor at the trial. This is the largest mafia fence in America. While he was in Sing Sing, he sent his son through Wharton. His son came out of Wharton in 1967 and started basically the first hedge fund called Steinhardt Fine Berkowitz. Wow. As he later disclosed, but only because I was about to disclose this, I believe, his money, his funding came from his dad's associates. He used to get sacks of cash, his dad's mob associates. In the 1970s, the mafia moved into Wall Street. And Michael Steinhardt was really the point of that, the tip of the spear of that. I know a lot about Steinhardt. For example, Steinhardt was very close friends, financier buddies with a guy named Mark Rich. Mark Rich got caught, he's a billionaire, was a billionaire, died a couple of years ago, got caught trading with Iran and Libya and had to flee the United States in the early 80s. And he lived out his days in Zug, Switzerland. And Steinhardt tried to get Mark Rich pardoned. Steinhardt was the guy who got Bill Clinton. There was a very controversial pardon on the last day of Clinton's presidency. And they pardoned Mark Rich for a bunch of his stuff, but some things they couldn't pardon for tax evasion stuff. But Steinhardt himself got dinged by the DOJ for manipulating U.S. Treasury instruments hmm. and had to sign a lifetime consent decree and pay, I think, a $70 million fine. So the DOJ has said this guy's not allowed to touch the securities of the United States government. Well, that's because Steinhardt's a market cheat. He knows how to rig the market. And Steinhardt has an absolute background. I mean, he's acknowledged that through the 70s, his funding was coming out of the mafia. It was coming from his dad's mob associates. Hmm. So this idea, and I know people roll their eyes, the idea that the mafia's on Wall Street. Go Google a couple things. Google Operation Uptick. The largest FBI arrest of the mafia in history happened 13 years ago. They swooped in on Wall Street, picked up 120 mafiosis around Wall Street. If you've seen that movie, The Wolf of Wall Street, Leonardo DiCaprio, the one sort of angle they left out is those kinds of shops, which are called boiler rooms, or mob. Wherever you see those kinds of shops, it's all, that's the mafia. And the Gambino and the Genovese family have sort of the background in the boiler room operations. There's a man on the FBI most wanted list, the godfather of Russian organized crime. His name is Semyon Nogolevich. Guy is one of the poorest human beings in the world. He's been involved in slavery, in gun running, drug running, everything in the world. The thing that actually landed him on the FBI most wanted list was when he got involved in market manipulation of a Philadelphia company called YBM Magnix. <laughs> Uh, and then he's the godfather of Russian organized crime. And I'll give you two more examples. Admiral Dennis Blair, who was the director, first director of national intelligence, his last speech to Congress in 2009, he talked about this grave danger faced by the United States that transnational organized crime has worked its way into Wall Street. And I'll also mention that in July of 2011, our president, Barack Obama, signed an executive order declaring an emergency that transnational organized crime has infiltrated our financial system. 
Hmm. I've been saying this since about 2004 publicly, and people think that, you know, you watch The Godfather too many times. <laughs> but I could tell you from swimming around in Wall Street, I started picking up there was very serious organized crime involvement. And in particular, and this leads to our Bitcoin subject, the place of infiltration or the place that's most dangerous is the settlement system. Now, I have a website called Deep Capture where I've got investigative journalists and we write about hedge funds and stuff. Yep. And we trace hundreds and hundreds of pages of connections between well-known hedge funds and organized crime. There's all sorts of deep connections over the years. Michael Milken, a criminal from the 80s, what he did was basically take an organized crime technique called a bust-out and move it into the world of high finance. And again, that's not me saying that. That's the FDIC, that's the federal government, the indictment. They're the ones who said this guy took the techniques of organized crime into high finance. Well, if you look at his association, he turns out to be all mobbed up. Hmm. And again, some of the same fat Tony Salerno, who was the boss of the Genevieve easy family. There's all these deep connections between organized crime and the worst but richest elements on Wall Street, including Stephen Cohen. And Stephen Cohen, Stephen Cohen got dinged in the last couple of years with a billion eight fines and a criminal indictment against his firm and such. So there are all kinds of brokerages on Wall Street that sort of go under some DOJ indictment for being a front for organized crime. Uh, there's been all kinds of brokerage houses, and again, it's all written about at deepcapture.com. There's one notorious bad boy firm called Spear Leeds Kellogg or something, and they were a notorious bad boy firm for really being at the very edge of the law. They got bought about 10 years ago and became known as Goldman Sachs Execution and Clearing. Hmm. So at the core of Goldman Sachs, there's a subsidiary that has a really dubious, shady history and a bunch of really nefarious market manipulating activities. And so so you can't think of Wall Street as a bunch of white shoe guys with Harvard MBAs. They may be white shoe, they may have Harvard MBAs, but there's real organized criminal element involved in Wall Street. What shocks me, I guess, is why is it that we don't hear about this often? You know, why don't we hear about this on the news? Why don't we have films coming out that will address this, that will go into great detail about the organized crime? Why are we not seeing this, if nothing else, in Hollywood? I don't understand that. That doesn't make sense to me. Well, you know, here there was this movie, The Wolf of Wall Street, which was about a boiler room, and it left out this whole angle that the boiler room shops are typically out on Long Island, and they're typically organized crime. You know, strip joints in America are basically mobbed up. And yeah. that's an industry that if you walk into a nice strip joint or high-end strip joint, you know it's mobbed up. So here's this movie about the Wolf of Wall Street, and it just left out that whole angle. I'll tell you, there's a reporter at Forbes named Nathan Vardy who wrote something in 2007 called Sewer Pipes. And it was about a hedge fund and a guy named Corey Robotsky, a Russian guy at a hedge fund called, I think, Near. And they were involved in a certain type of financing on Wall Street that was notorious, mobbed up. And he all but said that, well, he probably did say it in this article, that this was a corner of Wall Street that was pretty much purely organized crime operation. I had lunch with that reporter once, and he said, you know, Patrick, you uh, even in the United States, there are limits to where a journalist can go when he talks about organized crime. And I, Nathan Vardy, am right at the limit. You are way, way over that limit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> So, you know, there's you speaking up about it, and then he wrote that article, but nobody else speaking up about it? Is it just purely fear that somebody in Hollywood wouldn't want to put a movie out there because, what, they wouldn't be able to get it funded, or they wouldn't be able to get it distributed, or they would get uh, too much flack for it? I just don't understand that. Well, I didn't understand it either until I realized the system is captured all the way down. Everybody's in everybody's pocket. It's all, nobody cares. Those highfalutin hedge funds and the prime brokers are in it together. And in 2005, when I came out and said, look, the SEC is not protecting the United States. It's actually in the pocket of Wall Street. It's called a captured regulator. Mm -hmm. uh, I had, you know, like the New York Post ran Photoshop photos of me with UFOs coming out of my head. Like, <laughs> crazy, crazy. What a conspiracy theorist. He thinks that the SEC's in bed with Wall Street? Conspiracy theorist. You know, that whenever you hear somebody say, oh, conspiracy theorist, you got to put your hand on your wallet. You know, now I think if anybody, unless you're living under a rock, you get that the SEC is a lapdog of Wall Street. And historically, it has not protected America. It's been in bed with Wall Street. But boy, if you said that 10 years ago, people thought, uh, I thought you were crazy. Well, you know, so when you get a newspaper or a news outlet saying you're a conspiracy theorist, 
just like you said, you know, watch your wallet, right? Because it's a fair bet that they are in some way colluding, right? I mean, that's what it sounds like to me. Right. And in this case, there's about half a dozen reporters who are the hedge fund beat on Wall Street. And certainly this was the case up to 08. There were half a dozen reporters that were the hedge fund beat, and they set the tone. So I absolutely think some of them were in the pocket. And I know I can name the names of, I know how bad the bad ones were. Herb Greenberg, Bethany McLean, uh, Roddy Boyd, Joe Nacera, uh, Carol Ramon. Absolutely. Well, Carol Ramon, we have disclosed this. Carol Ramon was sharing an email account at Yahoo with a hedge fund, and they were cooperating on spreading rumors on message boards. So you have an award-winning Dow Jones reporter who was secretly sharing a a Yahoo account. And we revealed this, and some journalists wrote about it. I didn't name Carol Ramon, but we explained that we had gotten access to this email account, and we were to this Yahoo account. We were able to document it was being signed on to by a hedge fund called Rocker Partners, based in New Jersey, run by a guy named David Rocker, who absolutely... David Rocker was the protege of Michael Steinhardt, Hmm. and shared with Carol Ramon, who was an award-winning Dow Jones reporter, and they were conspiring together in this account, and they were spreading all these rumors from this account. So you have a reporter cooperating with a hedge fund. Oh, here's an interesting angle I left out. Michael Steinhardt had this very aggressive trading style based on getting inside information by the large fees he paid. So I have a cousin who actually covered Michael Steinhardt. He's told me that Michael Steinhardt once called him and said, hey, you came out with this downgrade on GM or IBM or something. Why didn't I know about this 10 minutes in advance? And my cousin said, come on, Mr. Steinhardt, you know I can't do that. (laughs) And Steinhardt says, look at what I pay you. I pay you $5 million a month in commissions. You tell me you can't give me that. Fancy information, he called it. So he had this very aggressive style based on inside information. Steinhardt had two protégés. One was a guy named David Rocker, who I ended up sort of tangling with and so forth. The other was a woman named Karen Backfish, was his head trader and his protégé. Karen Backfish married a fellow named Jim Cramer. And Jim Cramer disclosed in his early books how everything he learned, he learned from his wife, Karen Backfish. Now, Cramer downplays his connection to Steinhardt, but the truth is for two years he worked in Steinhardt's offices two doors down from Michael Steinhardt, and they were very close. Hmm. So, so when you see Jim Cramer, and that whole crew, like the Herb Greenberg, Jim Cramer crew, is, put it this way, Warren Buffett says if you ever sit down at a poker table and in 15 minutes you haven't figured out who the pigeon is, it's because you're the pigeon. <laughs> if you're getting your information from Jim Cramer or really anybody on CNBC, there's a fax machine in the offices of CNBC where the hedge funds fax their into the journalists and the journalists take the faxes and then go on air and say whatever they're told to say, which means that those hedge funds have a very special edge on the market. If you know what journalists are going to be saying in an hour or 10 minutes, you can trade ahead of it. And they use a fax machine because email leaves traces, faxes don't leave traces. Uh, So if you're getting your information from CNBC, you are the pigeon. You are just a hedge fund infomercial. You're just getting information that hedge funds want you to have so they can go front running. Man, that's amazing stuff. You know, I think a lot of people would listen to what you're saying and they would think, you know, this is like a movie or something. This is unbelievable. And I would simply say, well, yeah, truth is reality is stranger than fiction, right? I mean, we do live in a world where historically, going back to the beginning of time, people have colluded. People have conspired to take down government governments to set up military coups. I mean, this is the reality of what happens on this planet. And it's so funny to me and so sad that you have people who somehow have come to believe that things like this could never happen in America. They have this Disney sort of view of the world. Uh, Oh, wake up, sunshine. Wake up. Anyone listen to this who thinks that? I've been in the belly of the beast. I've been in the belly of the beast for over 10 years. I didn't start off this way. I got here by 04, 05. I had it all figured out. I had it all mapped out. I was out there saying, look, there's this criminal gang on Wall Street centered on Stephen Cohen. They're trading on inside information. They've bought off the SEC. They're creating systemic risk. Uh, the system's going to crack. All kinds of predictions I made came true, including the whole network that I was talking about has been rolled up. The feds have gone after and indicted you know, we arrested 200 people, about 80 or 90 have been put in jail for all the kinds of practices that I was talking about in 2005 that everyone was making fun of me saying, this, how could that be? Well, there's been like 
80 people put in jail for their involvement in these expert network systems. Well, you know, that makes me feel good because there are some times when I feel like everybody's been captured. No one's doing their job. No one is here to help us. No one's here to stop these criminals. But from what you're saying, there are people actually doing their jobs. That's great news, right? The only people who are, in my view, are the FBI. The only people who are that I trust. I don't trust the DOJ. I don't I'm, I'm not a fan of the FBI. I try to keep my distance from all federal authorities. I got to mention that as I started this stuff, I started getting warnings that burn. If you keep on doing this, you're going to become the object of a federal investigation. And I said, what are you talking about? This isn't Paraguay. You don't get retaliation from the government. And they were like, oh, you just wait and see. Sure enough, I became the object of six federal investigations over the last decade. Everyone goes wow. nowhere or is de minimis. Hmm. They, they get rolled up. They get dropped. They have to give me a letter that says, okay, and found nothing. And then six months later, they start a new one on something else. Oh, so man. I keep my distance from the feds by a country mile. However, all that said, the only ones who are doing their job, I think, are the FBI, which is yeah. why I think, you know, the SEC was a compromise. Can I give you a little bit of history, really oh, yeah. important history? Absolutely. Franklin Roosevelt said that of all the reforms he tried to make in America, the reform of Wall Street was the most hard fought. And he wanted to set up a division within the DOJ that would police Wall Street and arrest people. And the Wall Street pushed back. Will Rob pushed back with all their might. Will Rogers said something funny. Uh, them Wall Street boys sure are putting up a fuss about having a cop stationed on their street corner, <laughs> which should have told them something. Well, they end up with a compromise. And the compromise was to be a civil commission that had no real crime-fighting authority. It was just a civil commission that would study Wall Street and file lawsuits on behalf of the public when they saw some egregious activity. And that commission was called the Security and Exchange Commission. Mm -hmm. But it's a pure compromise. It has no real... They're the meter maids. They're the meter maids. The only thing that scares the gangsters are orange jumpsuits. The gangsters are not scared of meter maids. And so that's why I think the SEC should be unplugged and moved into the DOJ and be part of the DOJ's, you know, have real teeth. Sounds like it. Yeah, that would be a good move, right? I'll, I'll tell you another good move. I believe in capital punishment in extreme cases. And here's one. When you're talking about the sort of systemic fraud that has risked taking down our country, mm -hmm. I think they ought to, let's start hanging the bankers. Put some gallows up and start hanging people like Bernie Madoff. I agree completely. And don't stop till you get to uh, Lloyd Blankfein. <laughs> Just joking, Lloyd. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's funny. Okay, yeah, so... You want to hear some comment? I can go on and on about Goldman. It's crazy. You know the crazy deal that Goldman got? It's the only bank that got this special deal in 2008. They got to move their derivative. They had to suddenly become a bank in order to justify getting bailed out by the federal government. And so they did this rushed, uh, all these guys suddenly became banks. But Goldman got to move its entire derivative book into the subsidiary that was insured by the FDIC. It's the only one who got that deal. And you may have heard at the end of last year, as Congress was on its way out, did you hear about the Citibank deal? Congress did this thing that offended a bunch of people. They basically let all the banks do that, move their derivatives into their... That was just letting the rest of the banking system catch up with the deal Goldman got in 2008. Man, that's so sad. And, you know, who gave them that? Hank Paulson, the former chairman of Goldman. I mean, the incestuous relationship between Washington and Goldman Sachs is disgusting. And this is where republics go to die. Wow. This is what happens with republics. They get hijacked and it becomes an oligarchy. So how do you think it's going to play out? And how do you think that Bitcoin can play a part in this or digital currencies? Well, it's going to play out. I think I, don't, I had some hope that our president was going to confront this. He got snowed, didn't do it. Uh, nothing's been fixed. All we have is Novocaine. We've had big Novocaine injections. And I think that something 2008-like or worse is, is on the way. And nothing has fundamentally been fixed. And crypto actually has a role, both in preventing a deep crisis and, if a crisis occurs, making it survivable. Mm -hmm. See, what I got so obsessed about in the last decade was that the systems, I became aware that the systems of property, the systems for exchanging property that we just take for granted, these back office systems, mm -hmm. actually have quite a bit more slop in it than you might imagine. And there's daisy chains of 
contractual rights where you think, for example, you may think you own some stock in some American company, some publicly traded company. Do you have a 401k? You think you own some stock? You really don't. You don't own any stock. There's one company called CD and Company. It actually has all the property rights and all the stock. Then there's a corporation called the DTCC, which has contractual rights against it. And then brokers have contractual rights against the DTCC. And then another ring of brokers has contractual rights against the first ring. And then you have contractual rights from your broker. If you read the fine print of your brokerage statement, you'll find you actually don't own stock. What you own are basically like IOUs from somebody who has IOUs from somebody who has IOUs. So these daisy chains of IOUs against mm. the guy who actually owns it all. Wow. So that has played a role in just about every scandal you've heard about in the last six or seven years because those daisy chains get rubbery and the systems are losing track of who owns what. It played a role in the mortgage-backed security crisis, played a role in naked short selling and, and the things they had to fix when 2008, when the wheels started to come off. And... Why I think that crypto, like Bitcoin and the blockchain, can see the it isn't Bitcoin itself that I'm so enamored of. It's the blockchain and that technology Mm -hmm. because it means we can eliminate, we can actually go back to having real ownership. You you will actually have direct ownership in what you think you own, and it isn't just you have a contractual right against some company that has a contractual right against some company. That you could actually get back to real one-to-one ownership, Mm -hmm. and if that happens. I think it's going to take so much slop out of the system. The good thing is it's going to take all this slop out of the system. The bad thing is it's going to expose how much slop there is. And if it is as bad a Ponzi scheme as I think it is, and so much has been drained, has been embezzled from the system, that there's far more people who think they own things than there is the actual underlying ownership. And this, this comes up in naked short selling. It turns out there's brokerages that might have a thousand shares of a stock, but they're telling five different clients they each own those thousand shares. Hmm. It's fractional reserve banking without reserve requirements. And so it's going to expose as it gets adopted, it's going to expose this tremendous sort of bezel within the system. So the bad news is it's going to make it impossible to keep the Ponzi scheme afloat anymore. But the good news is it's going to make it impossible to keep the Ponzi scheme afloat anymore. (laughs) Wow. Yeah, that's heavy stuff. And it sounds to me like there's the possibility over the next couple of years or certainly over the next decade of a lot of people losing a lot of their wealth, their family wealth, their investments, whether it's 401ks or what have you. And that's that's pretty scary. Oh, it's very scary. But the truth is what's happened is you've already lost it. America's already lost it. There was a great economist, John Maynard Keynes. Some of us don't like him for other reasons, but he used to speak about the bezel. And the bezel was if you could sort of freeze time and suddenly and understand what there was in the financial system and then what everybody thought they owned in the financial system, there was an enormous difference. And that difference is the amount that had been embezzled over time out of the financial system. Hmm. And he called that amount the bezel. Hmm. Uh, I think that the bezel could be bigger than anything that can be filled in. It could be a black hole that no matter how much they try to throw into it, how many trillions, uh, I do know that the systems have lost track of who owns what. And you just hope that the music and the game of musical chairs doesn't stop. So I think that they've already lost it. I think that the system's just been looted. Uh, and the best we can hope for is to replace it or to adopt a robust system that is secure from these kinds of predators. And that system has finally come along, and it's the blockchain, it's crypto. There's all these centralized institutions we've had to trust, which have proven to be untrustworthy. And we no longer need the centralized institutions. We can go to peer-to-peer direct consensual exchange yeah. through the blockchain. It's so world historical what it does for us. Right, that we can utilize that public ledger that is indelible, right? Right, and transparent. Yes, and transparent, which is so important. But you are also working on a project to start an exchange, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Something to replace Wall Street? Yeah, it's a blockchain-based version of Wall Street. So you would actually, companies would be able to issue stock, and you wouldn't have custodians holding your stock and lying to you and telling, you know, five different people they owned it. You would actually have direct ownership in the stock you thought you did, just like the old time paper stock, but it couldn't be forged. And we call it Project Medici, and we will be having some announcements, I hope, this year about its progress, and we're making pretty good progress. Okay, and do you feel like you're getting a lot of flack from people who would not want Medici to exist? 
Well, it's kind of hard to stop it. Mm -hmm. The way we're doing it, it's hard to stop it. And surprisingly, and I have to say I'm kind of humbled by this, the Washington regulators have at least sent signs that they're willing to work with us and sprinkle their regulatory holy water on this and make it legal. We're trying to play this right down the middle. We're trying to build a system that meets all the needs of Washington. And Washington has legitimate needs. They don't want there to be money laundering. They want there to be KYC, know your Mm -hmm. customer, AML, anti-money laundering. They want any system that is developed uh, is supposed to have certain features. Well, we can develop all those features within a crypto-based system. So we want to accommodate the regulators. And so far, I'm pleasantly surprised to learn that the regulators are at least making the noises that they're going to be, you know, adults to work with and not just try to block this. Now, I think Wall Street, when they really figure out, when they see what we're building, they're going to understand. I mean, it has the potential to put them in the buggy whip business. And it's funny, I speak at conferences and sometimes Wall Street people come up and say to me things like, you know, we know that in 10 years, our whole system as we know it is going to be disintermediated. Mm. And we're all trying to figure out what you guys are doing, what you in the crypto movement are doing. But I've specifically been told on a number of occasions, we understand that within 10 years, the whole world as we know it will be done. Wow, that's a beautiful thought. Yeah, and they couldn't happen to nicer guys. <laughs> oh, I completely agree with you. That's a great thought, and uh, that's a great way to end the interview with a optimistic thought for the future. Well, Patrick, it's been great talking with you about these important issues today, and I have to just ask you a question. I watched a video of you doing a card trick a while back, and I have to say I was blown away by it. You went through an entire deck of cards, and somehow you memorized the order of these cards, and then you were able to recall each card in order before they were turned over. And you did this in front of an audience of, I don't know, there were 20 or so young people in the room. I have to ask you where that was, and of course, how did you do that? Well, that was at our company, just a meeting we were killing some time. And if you want to know the trick, the trick is there's no trick. <laughs> I really do. If you go on YouTube, look for my name and say deck of cards, you'll see that video up there. And the trick is it's not a trick. The trick is it's not a trick, so you could do that again, obviously. I can do that anytime I want. I can probably recite that deck from a couple years ago. Well, Believe me, I'm missing a whole bunch of critical human functions and faculties and such. I've looked at as eccentric by those close to me, but I'm made up for it in other ways. Hey, man, that's really cool. I, too, am missing some things that I wish that I had. But uh, I will say that just speaking with you in the times that I've listened to you on YouTube videos and some of the conferences that you've spoken at and a lot of your writing that I've read, I'm very impressed by how much you really seem to care about this country. And, you know, there's a lot of lip service given to this country, and there are a lot of people that will say one thing and do another thing. But you are one of the few people I listen to who is doing what you say you're going to do. You're able to do a lot, and you're out there doing it, and you're doing it to serve your country so much more than some of these other folks that other people consider heroes. I consider you a true American hero, and I do not say that to flatter you. I say that to thank you. Well, it's very kind of you, John. I figure I'm the last guy in America who has an excuse to take a dive. Here, I'll show you one other trick. You said you were born in 1963? Yes, sir. Tell me what's your birth date in 1963. October 15th. Uh... That was a Tuesday. October 15th, 1963 was a Tuesday. It was four weeks before Kennedy was shot. That is Looking exactly right. Look up the right. time and date on lot. Do you know if you were born on a Tuesday? I know for a fact I was born on a Tuesday. Well, how about that? <laughs> Mad skills like that. Can you believe I'm 52 and never been married with... Man, skills like that. Hey, I'm 51, right? Born in 63. You were born in 62. I am 51. I've never been married. And I say two things when people ask me in shock. You know, I'm hearing the Bible Belt. You've never been married? Why not? You know, they have their theories. And I say, well, it's a two-sided coin. On the one hand, if I never get married and meet the love of my life and have a family of my own, it will be the greatest single disappointment of my life. On the other side of the coin, uh, I can say with great relief, I've never been captured. So... (laughs) (laughs) Well, I've got, I've got a different answer. My answer is, uh, I never found the one that would have me. <laughs> hey, so I have an easier answer. But, and it's amazing. If there's ever a, a woman out there who needs a guy who can do mental magic like that, math <laughs> skills, memorize decky card, they know where to call. 
Well, you're a jack of all trades in many ways, and I am too. I don't know if I'm on the same level as you, although I fix a pretty mean lamp and I'm a pretty good woodworker, but I would say that you are definitely a good catch. I think that I'm definitely a good catch. I just don't know. It seems like there's some cosmic force that has some play in this whole thing, but I say don't give up hope because I believe that there is a wonderful woman out there for you and for me as well. Well, best of luck. I'll lay my money on you before I do on me. (laughs) Best of luck, John. Hey, you too. Hey, thanks. Nice talking with you, Patrick. Bye-bye. Bye. I know some of you may think I am a nerd, but I have for you a magic word, and today the magic word is criminal. C-R-I-M-I-N-A-L. Criminal. As in the sentence, wouldn't it be nice if we could take every criminal on Wall Street and hang them for their crimes? (laughs) Thank you very much, folks. It is always great to be back here in Amsterdam, yes. I love this city. I love the feel of it. I love the energy. I love the fact that you all have had so much to drink that I'm sure you're going to enjoy the performance this evening. (laughs) Uh, But seriously, folks, uh, I wrote this song uh, as a response to all of the stupid things I've done (laughs) uh, when it comes to Bitcoin uh, over the past three years and uh, all of my regrets that I have uh, and all of the times that I have legitimately had the Bitcoin blues. And so now I present for you the Bitcoin blues. Wasted all my time back in 09. I should have been mining blocks. Now all I've got's a Dogecoin rig and holes in my alpaca socks. I got them low down Bitcoin blues. I'm crying, hear the low down of Bitcoin news. I ain't lying to you, low down of Bitcoin blues. I'm dying, honey, low down of Bitcoin balloons. BTC. Convention came to my hometown at last. I had to sell my only Bitcoin just to buy a two day pass. I got them low down Bitcoin blues. I'm crying, it low down the Bitcoin news. I ain't lying to you. Low down a Bitcoin blues, I'm dying, honey. Low down a Bitcoin Young lady, I really hope that's your brother you're sitting next to because I finally got up the courage to ask you on a date after the show. I took a trip to China town for beef chow mein to go. Fortune cookie told me we know taking a bit to coin anymore. I got them low down Bitcoin blues. I'm crying, hear the low down of Bitcoin news. I ain't lying to you, low down of Bitcoin blues. I'm dying, honey, low down of Bitcoin blues. I went up town to see my CPA for some advice. He told me death and taxes, son, and then just roll Satoshi dice. I got the low down Bitcoin blues. I'm crying here the low down of Bitcoin news. I ain't lying to you. Low down a Bitcoin blues, I'm dying, honey. Low 
down a Bitcoin Thank you very much. <laughs> and as I promised, a little update on the tickets I won from Cointelegraph. I am still waiting to hear back from Maria Jones or anyone over there at Cointelegraph. Hello, Cointelegraph. Can you hear me? Dee 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 dee. Come in, Cointelegraph. Dee 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 dee. Come in, Cointelegraph. I just know that the tickets I won to the Texas Bitcoin Conference are sitting in a drawer there in Maria's desk. But rumor has it that Maria is on an extended vacation in the Netherlands and can't be reached at the moment. Maria, I hope you're enjoying your vacation, and when you get back, I hope you'll give me a shout and I can get those tickets I won. <laughs> I'd like to thank my guest on today's show, Mr. Patrick Byrne. Patrick, thank you so much, sir, for your service to the United States of America. Patrick is one of the very few people I've ever met who is willing to stand up to organized crime and to stand up and fight for our public schools, which are in dire straits. What an absolute travesty that public school administrators would put their own selfish interests over the interests of our teachers and our children. Shame on you, you lowlifes, doing harm to the lives and the minds of our children. Never forget there is room for you at the gallows. If you've enjoyed the show today, please take a minute to leave a comment on Let's Talk Bitcoin in the comments section right there below the show notes. You can also leave a message on SoundCloud or do the old-fashioned thing and send me an email. And of course, Bitcoin and Litecoin tips are always appreciated by the hardworking writers and podcasters in the Bitcoin world. Many of us work as volunteers and sure could use those tips. You can send me $5 or $0.05 cents and I will be just as happy knowing that this podcast put a smile on your face or made your day a little bit better. Signing off now from East Nashville, Tennessee, I'm your host, John Barrett, with my trusty companion, Maxwell, by my side. Say goodbye, Maxwell. Y'all be good to each other out there now, and remember, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men and women to do nothing. Now climb aboard, y'all. This train is bound for glory. And there's plenty of room for all. Well, Satoshi Nakamoto, that's a name I love to say. And we don't know much about him, but he came to save the day. When he wrote about the way things are and the way things ought to be, he gave us all a protocol this world had never seen. A Bitcoin as you're going into the old blockchain. A Bitcoin, I know you're going to rain, going to rain. Till everybody knows, everybody knows, till everybody knows your name. Down the road it will be told about the death of old Mount Gox About traders trading altar coins and miners mining blocks But them good old boys back in Illinois and on down through Tennessee See, they don't care to be a millionaire, they're just wanting to be free A Bitcoin as you're going into the old blockchain A Bitcoin, I know you're going to rain, going to rain Till everybody knows, everybody knows, till everybody knows your name While the bankers count our money out for every government 
Oh, Bitcoin flies on through the skies of virtuality, a promise to deliver us from age-old tyranny. Oh, Bitcoin, as you're going into the old blockchain, oh, Bitcoin, I know you're going to rain, going to rain. Till everybody knows, everybody knows, till everybody knows your name. Till everybody knows, everybody knows, till everybody knows your Give me some exposure. Everybody knows your name. Sing it. Oh, Lord, pass me some more. Oh, Lord, before I have to go. Oh, Lord, pass me some more. Oh, Lord, before I have to go. Thank you, East Nashville. Y'all be good to each other out there, you hear?